Hi, thank you. Um, so I don't have to read the title screen. Also, I just want to apologize for the most boring slides that you're about to see. I go like super minimal. Um, there are no pictures, hardly at all, and hardly any color. Um, so this is, I've been attending some of the sessions here, and I know all of you are well-versed in mismatch theory, but I just want to throw out there right now that we are currently experiencing unprecedented sedentarism. I mean, like right now, literally. <laughs> but, you know, in a much larger context, unprecedented. So, I mean, everyone has heard move more. We might have even said it to someone else today. You just need to move more. But move more might not be the most accurate way to explain what's going on. So there are, there's three terms that are used, and I've heard them all, I think, today. When we're talking about movement, we're using them interchangeably, and they are exercise, physical activity, and movement. But they don't all mean the same thing. So I thought we could start with some basic foundational uh, definitions. So physical activity is any movement produced by skeletal muscles that is going to result in energy expenditure or KCAL expenditure and is positively related to physical fitness, which um, is measured through, there are various physical fitness tests. This is, I figure diagrams are easy sometimes. So these are examples of physical activity. So anything that is utilizing your body that you could say, okay, I, if, I, if you're wearing some sort of monitor, it would register as movement. If you had your pedometer, you might see some steps increase, even if you weren't stepping. If you're wearing an accelerometer, there'd be changes in position of your body. They would relate back to these larger um, gross motions that we associate with moving. Exercise, though, is, is a subcategory of physical activity. The clinical definition is exercise is physical activity that is planned, structured, repetitive, and again, the reason that you're doing it is because it's going to improve your performance um, or maintain your performance on these physical fitness tests or variables. So these are some examples of exercise. I had fun creating them. This is the relationship between physical activity and exercise, just so you can kind of get a sense of the scale of the thing and, and how they relate to, to each other. I mean, spatially isn't quite the right word, but opportunity. If we could think of time as space. Oh, this isn't a physics conference, but if you could think of the capacity that you have for movement within a day, your capacity for exercise, meaning the only thing getting done during that period of time was improving your physical fitness, it would be smaller than maybe your capacity for getting physical activity done because you could be on a walk with your friends so it could also be social time or you could be riding your bike to the grocery store so you could be checking something off of your list besides simply training towards a particular set of physical fitness variables so what's movement because i said there are three different terms movement is the most general out of the three it's like a geometrical definition it's a change in the sh in the shape of your body or really in the shape of a tissue or in the shape of a cell, as we'll eventually get to. So it's movement is occurring if those cells are being displaced from point A to point B or have a change in shape. So I've just done a few different examples of a few different uh, loads that you could place on a, on a tissue and thus the cells within it. So why the need to clarify? The issue with the definition of using them interchangeably is that physical activity and exercise really come from a, a period of time when the understandings of the benefits of exercise or physical activity related back to how many calories you were expending. It's a calories in, calories out understanding. And so we've kind of moved past that a little bit, but we're anchored a little bit by the language that we're using. And so um, I will often see exercise to mean hard, physical activity to be moderate and movement to be 
the easy stuff, right? Like that there's an understanding of them relating to how hard you're working while you're doing it. So they're tied primarily to kcal expenditure. So if you can't have a measurable caloric expenditure or an EMG reading while you're doing it, it wouldn't be movement, which is a problem because movement is simply the geometrical change in shape of something. So they don't refer they don't fully represent movement, and they often refer to full body states or whole body states, meaning you usually perceive yourself as someone who is active or someone who is sedentary, someone who is exercising. You're not exercising right now. Um, you're not really um, physically active, but you are moving when you sat down parts of you displaced to facilitate that. So you, you are moving parts of you right now, and so that's a little bit more subtle. Um, and then also, we perceive that when we exercise or when we're partaking in physical activity and we use it in lieu of um, movement, then we kind of project that whatever benefits come from the exercise are whole body benefits. Our understanding is we are participating in a whole body thing. And then they also are failing, these terms are failing to integrate non-fitness benefits that we now recognize from movement or effects of movement that are non-fitness related. And so it makes it hard, I think, to discuss them or use them accurately. So mechanotransduction is the process by which cells are sensing they're, it's, they're being deformed. So if we went back to those tissue types where I was showing how they were deformed or changed position, how they were moved, the cells are sensing those movements via their cytoskeleton, and they are translating mechanical input, distortions, however you want to think about it, created by their physical environment into biochemical signals, and that's changing the behavior of the cell. It's changing the structure of the cell, and the cell is adapting to what it's feeling on a cellular level. So if you uh, sat on the, or didn't sit on it, but attended the dentistry panel, they are talking about how contraptions could pull or change the shapes of the bones. They're, through tensions, pressures, compressions, you're able to elicit a response or a change in a structure shape, certainly around um, when you're growing and younger, it's a little bit easier because you're your rate of production is so much higher, but mechanotransduction is used, I mean, if you get physical therapy and they're trying to find specific muscles to contract and thus pull in other shapes, you don't usually say, like, I had a mechanotransduction section, session, but like that's what's happening. You're, you're changing the loads that you're experiencing and the resting tensions through adaptation, which then go on to shape the body, literally, but also is, is changing the behavior of the cell itself. So we don't think too much about the local effects of movement. And so this is, this is an example. This is one of the probably most interesting studies I've read in a long time because they used the same person for both the subject and the control. This is the first time they've done an exercise study like this. So they had, they took biopsies of, um, each thigh in, in a single subject, and they gave them one leg training. So it was just, oh, I mean, the most boring program ever. Three months, four times a week, leg extensions for 45 minutes. No. Also known as the worst personal training program ever. <laughs> At the end, they re-biopsied. So they, these people had been doing cardiovascular exercise, right? They brought up their whole body measures, but there was only one side of the body moved to create it, moving to create that state. And so within the moving tissue, there were changes within the cellular behavior, within the like the epigenetics or the epigenome, and then in DNA myelination. So I bolded the part that I wanted to take away, which is the parts of you that do it are changing. Like that's the most simple way we can start to change our idea from movement as a whole body phenomenon, which it is, but it is also a local phenomenon. And it's interesting because the, the takeaway of this study, the conclusion was, this is why cardiovascular exercise is working, because when you're doing it, you're getting these changes. Or I actually read the opposite conclusion, because you actually were doing cardiovascular exercise. You were in a cardiovascular whole body state. 
but only the parts of you received the protective benefits of exercise. So it was less the cardiovascular state or physical fitness measure than it was the actual parts that, of the physical displacement, the parts that were doing physical displacement. So movement can affect you on the whole body level. It can create definitely systemic responses. There are whole body adaptations, but there are also local adaptations. There's local responses to movement. And it doesn't really require an intention where exercise is, is it's not so much a difference in what you're doing physically, but it is the structure of what you're doing, the repetitiveness of it. It's any change in geometry or location, and it does not have to be something that relates to KCALs. For example, I guess I just came off the, the dentistry one, so was, I'm thinking about breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is a movement. It is the movement of the tongue against the palate and the tensions that are created by a vacuum and also like almost like peristaltic activity of the tongue, undulation certainly, and compression. Those are like, that's, is that exercise? No, you know, is it, is it physical activity? Maybe, I'm not sure what the caloric expenditure is of breastfeeding, having done it, I know that it's tremendous to lactate, um, but as far as being the actual nurser, I'm not sure, or the suckling, nursling, sucklings, uh, <laughs> that's a funny word, um, that it is, that entire systems depend on this movement that so far we have no place for in our discussions about movement, right? It's a non-physical fitness in the way that we think of exercise or physical fitness. So this is, again, another picture. This is how they relate to each other. This is movement surrounding physical activity, surrounding exercise. So we are, when we think of sedentarism, we think I'm not getting my exercise. What I'm saying is the unprecedented of our sedentarism is relating to our, to, our, to our capacity, but certainly our historical experience of movement throughout your entire timeline. Non-physical or physical activity movement. So I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna skip forward here for a second so that you can see, I'm talking about the things that don't fit into physical activity or exercise. These are ones that are currently, I, I don't know if anyone would, these would pop into your head if I said, are you getting enough movement? It's like, I don't know, am I walking over a lot of texture? Is my foot bones being displaced by texture? Did I breastfeed for you know a few years? Uh, how far do I look on a regular basis? Because, right, that's a ciliary muscle adapt. There's a range of motion to your eye that you might not be using if you're constantly surrounded within things that are 30 feet from your face. So, i oh, sorry if you were reading that. I'll, I'll, I'll go forward one more time. But I wanted to go back because not th that category of movements that is currently outside of what most people are talking about when they use the term movement and exercise and physical activity are these really, they are abundant and they move, the distribution of movement is very high, but it's the shapes that you, it's the shapes that you become when you interact with a particular environment. Like you are sitting in a particular way, mostly because that was there, but also because that is there so often, you're, you have adaptations to that that make it easier for you to sit in that than to sit on the floor, and I see you guys over there too, just so you know, on the floor. Um, it's your furniture, it's the clothing, it's belts, it's the shoes that you have on your feet, and again, it's the terrain when you do locomote that you're locomoting over or through. It's the pressure, right? If you push on your arm for a second, take your hands and push into your arm and look at that, that's movement. But your world, our world, is mostly cushioned, mostly flat, mostly level. We've reduced many, we've reduced much of those distortions that would have been extremely abundant. And then we cre create exercise programs to like roll on things on purpose, right? Like I'll sit in the thing and then I'll roll on something later to recreate basically pressure, basically an input. Um, reactions to temperature, you've got to, somewhere between a million and a billion um, muscles that move each one of your hair follicles, 
right? So you have, it's called herpilation or goosebumps is the more, is the term the kids use these days. So that's, it, you have these movements that are all over and thermal regulation has been specifically parsed from the definitions of physical activity and exercise because, they, because they're non-musculoskeletal, because they go over to um, thermal regulation, which is its own energetic systems, even though it's one system. So as we're starting to see more data, if you've been taking other workshops or reading about cold exposure um, and the, the result of constant ambient temperature, like the fact that we're in climate control so much of the time, you are missing, the, it would be said, you're missing the caloric expenditure of thermal regulation. I said yes, because you're missing the movement of thermal regulation, that there are parts of you that move to get your heat to different places or to warm you or to trap air. Those are all movement-driven systems. So if you don't stimulate them, they don't respond. Um, so do you want to look at that for a second? I put using your jaw as a tool on there. I hope the dentists aren't upset. There's a, there's a really awesome video of different indigenous cultures shucking entire coconuts with their teeth, meaning, I mean, I was told, like, never open anything with your teeth. And teeth, and one of the, one of the understandings of palate formation, jaw, dental health is the idea that, that teeth were a tool until we became more more tooled, I don't know if that's the right word, but that, that, that was, it's a way of holding. It's a way of holding, pulling, processing, lots of processing movements because of course, if you're gonna eat anything before you talk about your diet, you have to talk about the movements that make plants and animals edible. And so there are mechanical nutrients really that we've gotten rid of through milling and grinding. Um, one of my favorite movements here is chewing. Chewing your food to show how it works kind of in a system here is chewing your food, they now recognize that the chewing is part of how the brain gets its circulation. So when you remove chewing, you are removing something else that happens with movement that is non-musculoskeletal, non-fitness related. And so there's a relationship between um, decreased hippocampus function and decreased ability to chew. So it's, I just find it all fascinating, hence I keep talking about it. So physical fitness, the definition that like we're trying to always relate back to is the ability to carry out your daily tasks. Um, that you don't get tired while you're doing it, that you do kind of spry, and then when you're done, that you can do the things that you would like to be able to do. And then, of course, there's this always kind of idea of, in the case of an emergency, if you have to get somewhere fast or need some strength, that that also is being taken care of in your daily tasks. Now, the issue with this definition is what are our daily tasks? If you don't have any, you know, if your daily tasks involve that you have to operate your computer all day long, like you're nailing it. Like you were, we're really good at carrying out our daily tasks. So it's kind of a lackluster, if you look at the HOSDA, which you know in movement we pull quite a bit of data from as we're trying to create uh, ancestral models, their daily tasks are very different than our daily tasks. And so something that's not so um, circular is perhaps needed. So this is just a, an example I put the dot, dot, dot because you really can't come up with a function that at some time doesn't require movement, even in real time, to increase its function. Like that movement is a part of all of these systems. Anatomy, we don't, anatomy, we've made it kind of the, the, the part, but when it is in vivo, like movement is part of those parts. It's one of those parts. And so it's, it's everything. It's the fact that you can eat, chew, digest, swallow, that you can procreate and carry your child and push it out and, and that your immunity is great and, and the way that your eyes work, all your sensory input is mechanical in nature oftentimes, not all the times, but as far as mechanosensors go, very mechanical. I added cerebral because movement, again, is gonna be part of how those systems sometimes operate, sometimes just maintain their own health. Sometimes nourishment is part, like movement is how they're getting their nourishment. So we need to clarify movement 
I think this is gonna be the starting place for both the scientific or academic pursuits of understanding what it is and then also the practical, those who are applying what is found through scientific investigation. So like we have to know how, if we're gonna understand how movement works, we have to make sure we're not talking about how exercise works or how physical activity works. Um, are, are, your, are your exercise tests even sensitive to these all these non-exercise things? Like how much does physical fitness tests doing well on those relate back to all of the other system performances? Like are, can you be fit and can you have poor any other system in here? You know, if, it, if, if, if you are able to be fit on the tests and you're noticing major disruptions in the other systems, then we can expand our, our test to be more, more sensitive to how much movement we're doing and how that's relating back to the state of our body. More discussion about the non-fitness benefits to movement. And then also, if we're to try to quantify what mismatch is, we have to talk about what movement is first before we can see where we're getting it and where we're not getting it. And then is move more adequate from the practical side of things? How do you convey this new idea of move more of you, right? It's not just ramping up the performance of certain fitness variables using your body in the same way that there's some movement diversity needed. And then do we do an exercise prescription or a physical activity prescription or a movement prescription when our outlet for this type of information is really just physical therapy or movement teachers who have an exercise or physical activity understanding at this point. So movement mismatch, we're often, the, the challenge with doing science is you can't really do it above the culture that's doing it. So we are a sedentary culture and our understandings of exercise and movement at this time are really that these are what movement is because it, it makes up the bulk of the movement that we are doing. So we tend to look on the systemic or large scale. We look at intensities, percentages, total calories, number of steps, total minutes. Like th that's the way that even if you take data on the HASDA, which I'm about to show you, we tend to reduce it down to these large categories and duplicate the categories, not the moves themselves. But on the smaller scale, geometrical variance is going to change the, the types of movements that you're doing. Um, they're gonna move different parts of you, your cells in different ways. And then once we get this idea that every geometry of your body is moving the cells within your body differently, then, we're, then the next more practical thing is, well, what types of movements bring about which types of geometries? So this is like that fit fitness influence mindset. So I think it was 46 Hazda hunter-gatherers were connected to heart rate monitors for four two-week periods during um, like one, one connection for each season to get an average of seasonal distribution of movement given that the food availability and the climate and temperature is gonna all fluctuate. So that the, the average motion that was happening here was 221 minutes of light. So the percentages are up there if you wanna see what it is of maximum heart rate. Uh, about a, two hours in moderate and 20 minutes in vigorous. But that's the average movement that they are producing, even though it's not average. It's not being executed in an average way, but this kind of gives you a sense of the, the scope. But the conclusion was that seeing this, the, the paper itself was really calling back, they grouped moderate and vigorous, and they're saying that moderate to vigorous daily activity is what this group with excellent, uh, very low cardiovascular risk is doing, not really mentioning, one, the 220 minutes of lighter activity, which are shifts in geometry. So it's not just the state of your heart, but it's the fact that you were in motion for a very large portion of time. It was again reduced to the moderate portion and the vigorous portion, um, which again, if we put it on that fitness mindset, the focus was on the intensities, that larger scale. Like it was reduced to the intensities again, not the geometrical variance. And to me, I, what the part that I found most interesting was the vigorous activity that was found in the group, in the largest people, the largest groups that were measured was from carrying stuff, like carrying kids, food, and water. It wasn't 
getting your heart rate up in a way just to get your heart rate up. It wasn't, you know, persistence hunting or sprinting or anything like that. It was that you're carrying heavy, awkward loads longer than you would like to be carrying them and that you're going to notice that response. But in one, there's one kind of big paper that I see circulated a lot through Ancestral Health. It's um, Hunter Gatherer Fitness in the 21st Century. You've probably seen it referenced on any, almost anything that you've read regarding ancestral movement. And again, those conclusions were to duplicate the intensities. Ne not very much mention of the duration. We're starting to see the duration, meaning like it's going to be more like six hours, friends, not 90 minutes. Um, but that it's light the rest of the time. And then hopefully what we start seeing is a call at calling out of mode. So an exercise, the mode would be the way, the way that you get your intensities, like what are you doing? Are you carrying sandbags? Um, are you running on a treadmill? It's, it's the way that you're going about doing it. So we might need to be making sure that the geometry, thank you, that the geometry is changing in order to get that distribution of movement. And we kind of know it, we call it cross training, right? Like, oh, you need to mix up your exercises. But the diversity, certainly of what the HASDA, HASDA are used because they subsist like 90% on wild food. So they're certainly, I mean, they're modern people, but they subsist on 90%, like, which means they are, we say hunting and gathering, but if we could break it down, it's bending, squatting, it's tuber digging, so much tuber digging, um, like this. And then when you're done, it's tuber mashing, and then tuber scraping, and then like it's, it's all these motions that if you came to an exercise class to do acorn flower making, it would just like, it's, they're small, but the distribution of body use is very, very high. And so I feel like we're trying to, through intensity, exercise off the fact that what, how we're actually moving is a very narrow range, right? Like we're trying, you can't, you can't eat your, you can't eat a soup. There are no superfoods, right? There's not one food that will nourish you. Every food, if you only consumed one, would leave you with a nutritional deficit. It's the same with movement. That's why I call it nutritious movement. Okay, so ecology, I have three minutes left. I'm gonna start talking fast. Ecology is a branch of biology that deals with the relationship of an organisms, like an organism to another organism within its area and their physical surroundings. So movement ecology then is, we tend to go, uh, we tend to parse out in a science first before we start integrating it back in. We're all familiar with ecology now because of like the good, a good example is the wolves in Yellowstone. Wolves make it hard for humans to farm or hunt. And so we killed them all at a particular period of time because that's better for us, but it turned out that they were keystone. They were a keystone species, which means that they are in a relationship with everything around them. And when we got rid of them, the deer or the, the antelope or anything that the wolf would eat flourished and then it ate down all the grass, which affected the riparian or the, the, the water flow and, and the way, and like the, the mice increase, which then like affected the birds and beat goes on. So movement ecology is like, it's like time to, go beyond exercise to start understanding the broader implications. At this point, maybe just the broader to your own body, but you can keep going and talking about body, body, body to body relationships. And especially when it comes to mismatch. So there's like the local scale, looking at you know, what your wrists are doing and your elbows are doing. I won't even talk at looking at the cellular scale right now. There's a systemic scale, looking at those big totals that are often used in research because they're, they're easier. You can hook someone up to something to show their heart rate fluctuation, you can't really hook someone up to something that shows how every single joint changed positions and how the cells were loaded, yet it might come. But on a larger scale, the purpose of movement, the initiator of movement, and how does movement fit into life, if we were just to look at the HAZA, those would be ways of further quantifying the mismatch, right? Instead of pulling out and trying to fit ancestral understandings back into the 1980s fitness variables, which is where that language comes from, we might have to evolve the language to allow this new system to fully express itself. So movement is a response. We kind of know that. It's like, yeah, I know I signal, touch this button, and it happens. But I would say that your 
your drive to move and like initially is a response to hunger or getting something that you need. Now we're having to create the reason for it, a justification, you're having to use willpower, you're having to use all these things. You know, be a good planner. Like you're having to call on all these strategies because we've made an environment that doesn't move us at all and kind of a, a situation where most of the movement is outsourced. So habitat, for all the architects in the room, habitat, yes, you move through your environment, but your environment is moving you right back. So given that, there's been a couple of papers that have started to say, hey, we might, instead of just telling people how to move which parts, start saying, and you might have to change your environment so it facilitates more movement. Like, I don't have any furniture in my house. I have furniture, but I don't have any chairs. And if you just get rid of the chairs, it's kind of like getting rid of ice cream. Like, it's very hard to have someone change the way that they're eating and then put them in a plate, like a grocery store. It's like, you have to live in this grocery store and only make sure you eat from these particular aisles. When it's there, you're constantly, you either have to have very strong willpower, but you're constantly taking yourself to eat the more difficult thing, you know, not the easy thing to digest or the thing with the red wrapper that's waving in your face, the thing that requires that you do more work to produce it oftentimes. So your habitat, if it's the shape of what you take rest on, how you're placing your body upon it, I encourage everyone to go home and take a chair to butt ratio of your house. How many butts in your house? How many seats in your house? And you'll be surprised when it's upward sometimes of 30 to 40 seats in a two butt home. <laughs> Very, that's like the average. You're right, and like you get to do it. And you have to even, you have to count every, if it's a, co if it's a couch, every cushion is a seat. Because it's communicating to you, right? Um, your habitat is the, is the temperature, it's the shapes of what, what you're walking over, it's how you can see. So because that's what your habitat is, it's influencing all of these systems. These systems that we talked about. These aren't, I'm not even talking about exercise or physical activity at this time, not only talking about that. We're expanding to go, wow, my, the environment of a location, like we're understanding like how to quantify an environment. Environment is all the interactions. It's the people that are around you, the family, um, the, the people who are, they're moving you, they're feeding you and, and vice versa. Like all those things have the potential to be influencing the performance of these systems. Thank you. So again, I mentioned that we're a sedentary culture. We're a primarily movement outsourcing culture. We're trying to reverse engineer how movement works in, Nutrition, it's a little bit different because in nutrition, in nutritional science, most people are still eating. You can, you have to kind of dive into your food on a regular basis, but movement is really kind of still being studied from a computer, from sitting. Oh, she said, don't tell her to stop, let her keep going. I love you, thank you. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> so when you are sedentary, it's hard to, I think, perceive of these movements that are outside of our cultural box because it's, they're without the habitat, like it, they're within the habitat. It's the, the confines of movement are set by the structures that you're in most often. So again, we are currently experiencing unprecedented sedentarism, and this is what we need to be talking about, and this is what we're talking about. We're spending a lot of time, billions of dollars of conversation on this, when we're here, and it's just time, I mean, we have enough, there's enough data, like really the, the conversations can be challenged to go a little bit farther, so I'll just leave you with that. Think and move outside the exercise box, right? We're gonna go big, go to movement, okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Katie. So the microphone over there is available if you want to head over for questions. If it's not working, there's a switch. We'll get it on. So. Thank you, Katie. I just wanted to um, think about all the ways in which Katie's changed my life in terms of how I move in the house. So I just thought it would be kind of fun to hear someone just talk about how things change. Not that I've read all of her books, 
but she has an incredible amount of material out there. One of the things that helped me, I lived in Ventura at one time. She, she uh, had a video of what her house looked like in Ventura showing that she didn't have any furniture. So then over time, and then also something about how uh, the people who take your workshops and stuff, uh, they get to the point where they can sleep on, on the carpet or floor with no mattress. And she, she basically said how your body um, changes to like the shape of your pillow or, or the bed and that type of thing. So I got to the point, <laughs> you can imagine my husband just thinks I'm so strange. I got to the point where I realized I couldn't sleep in the bed anymore because it just wasn't right. I actually put a board in it and, and he noted n underneath the, the uh, mattress and he noted actually it was, was helpful to him. So I got to the point where I sleep on a board uh, with maybe like a yoga mat, just just that thick. Um, I'm careful not to have too many pillows and that kind of thing. Um, I don't when I hardly watch television. That was another thing about movement. Um, uh, so I sleep on. Excuse me. I sit on the floor, maybe on a little pad with my food instead of. I never sit. I look at a dining table and it just feels like it hurts. It, it's just not something. Because I sit at the computer a little bit. Or I also, uh, for instance, Guillermo, wherever you are, yeah, you, re you remarked on those little chairs. I buy children's uh, little chairs, camping chairs, and then so if I have people over, they have an option to sit in a little camping chair <laughs> so that you're squatting, and, uh, or they can sit on you know rugs and that kind of thing. Uh, I sleep outside as much as I can. I am fortunate. I have a ginormous backyard, so I'm able to kind of hide and sleep outside. And so when I wake up, the, the, right away, I'm, my, I'm grounding. I'm always barefoot, um, working in the yard, doing all that kind of thing. And then I'll also kind of affect getting into a squat when I don't necessarily need to do some exercise that way. And so something so funny, um, I might show this to my husband. He was so furious to me as I, at me as I was trying to get ready for this, this trip because about six hours before the uh, plane was to leave, I had gotten a splinter in the bottom of my foot. And he said, I've told you to wear shoes. <laughs> and it's so fun that I'm going to a place where people don't wear shoes and uh, get, the, get these facts. So everything's changed. Thanks, Marty. So I don't know if that's an endorsement. Sleep on the floor and marital <laughs> fights. Yeah. So I had a question about something that I thought might be illustrative uh, regarding the uh, the effects of movement with your environment and things like that. There's a, a practice that I've seen. Um, I think it sort of originated in Russia that they use the term baby yoga. Um, is that something? Yeah, that yeah, I know what right. So about. it's like, it involves stuff that looks pretty crazy. If you're not accustomed to seeing it, like picking up the kids and like swinging them by their legs and like swinging them all around. <laughs> <laughs> like it's really, but they, but they report and I don't, I haven't verified this. They report a lot of success with both like actually like mental um, uh, resilience, I guess, but also, you know, physical strength in kids that were put through that process. And I was curious, one, if you have an opinion on that in particular and just also use as an illustration of the effects of these forces that even precede the individual's ability to exert their own, um, you know, forces like that. That's actually what I talked about at my first AHS a few years ago. So, um, one, I don't endorse that anyone pick up and swing their baby by their arms or their legs. However, I, I don't condemn the practice. It's actually, there's a, the most research on it, and really, I think, probably the greatest data on the number of positions assumed by infants and children come from, I think, looking at, a, it's a Mali population, um, uh, in a Mali, indigenous to Mali population. And they actually have what looks, I've seen that YouTube video and it's like, yeah, it's, it's intense to watch. It thinks it looks a little bit different, but there's, there's diagrams, not pictures in the actual data collection. Um, and it is arm suspension, single arm suspension, double arm suspension, leg suspension. It looks very similar to what all other primates do with their infants. 
you know, where, where, <laughs> and I'll just end it there, but to your other point, <clears throat> You're, you're moving upon birth. You're actually moving before birth, and you, you are in a particular environment, and so there are tensions within that environment that might affect your space to move as an infant or as a fetus. But then once you're born, you're moving right away, and we have particular cultural practices that usually are uh, immobilization. Like, you know, we, don't, we, we, we have different caring practices, and I've seen in ancestral health speak to other areas of this i don't know if it's relating back to movement so much as it would attach to other perceived variables of warmth um connection and whatnot but if you're starting to imagine like how many loads how many seconds do you spend with your head up that starts on day one versus for us we would do no unsupported head movement you certainly wouldn't take your baby out on like a 10 mile walk on the day that it was two days old, you know, and ask that it start to respond to those lows, but there are many cultures that do, and I did with my own children, so I got a little Diane Fossey on my own family. So we did, you know, we have done, as we try to do as close to the, like, movement and the nutritional components as possible just to see what would happen, but they, you start moving, your, your babies are at the whim of the environment more so really than any other person because they don't have the capacity to go, you know what, I know there's a chair here, but I'm going to sit on the floor. They are shaped early on. So as we become more and more sedentary, it's in one of the books that I said, you know, in the 1950s, there were no bucket seats. But over time, especially as we got more sedentary right around that time where we started to go into the computer tech and people were sitting more, sitting upright caused back pain, so they started to put create bucket seats and now when you're born you're born into bucket seats which means you don't have the option of not having that bucket shaped body because you are being mechanically transduced by your environment so you could we think of it as like orthodontia makes sense like oh yeah you're putting these on it's pulling around but you don't think when you're getting to your car that the same phenomenon or other bucket structure that all that same phenomenon is at play because it's just a physical principle of mechanics supply to biology Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm a personal trainer, and a lot of my clients are spending 8, 10, 12, 14 hours at a desk. Is there anything outside of, you know, they come in, they meet with me maybe three hours a week, which isn't much. Is there anything you could suggest for someone that's kind of stuck in an office-type position that can add movement to their daily lives? Well, yeah, I mean, like, that's pretty much what I do all day long is make those suggestions in, available in various places. So there are so many ways to move. So again, because we think exercise, the how do I exercise in my office is like get a chin-up bar or, you know, or get a, a walking desk. Some things that aren't really attainable for many people. And a lot of work has specific positions that are associated, that are required of it. I don't know why I keep bringing up the dentist panel really, you know, made it like, how do you do this? You can't be like, well, I have to keep, you know, myself in this position. You got to get in there. If you're a mechanic, you got to get in there. Like there's movements and repetitive movements that are required. If you can expand your, your understanding, like when people come to you to exercise at the end of a 10 hour sitting bout, they're often trying to, they're trying to exercise off the effects of two things. One is stillness or sedentarism, but two is the other aspect of, of biomechanics, which is they're actually moving, their cells were moving. It was just moved into a single position for 10 hours. So there's two, like you could delineate sitting into two, two things. Is it the stillness or is it the repetitive positioning? They're, they're having separate effects on the body. So one thing that you could do to get people moving more while they're still in their office is to change that repetitive positioning. So you can have your hands on a keyboard or your eyes on a computer and still be changing the geometry of your body. It doesn't have to be as big as a treadmill desk because you don't have to be hitting fitness or intensity variables. You could just, at least when you start, just take your sedentarism in a different geometry and you're moving, you're moving differently.